right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Eric Moreland. Um, uh, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist uh, here at New Start Recovery Concord. Uh, I have the pleasure tonight of uh, hosting the next installation of our ongoing psychoeducational lecture series. Uh, tonight's topic I'll be presenting on is uh, principles of addiction biology, uh, going over uh, aspects of the disease model of addiction. Uh, so just a little background about myself. Uh, I received my undergraduate uh, a BA in psychology at UC Berkeley. Um, attended my, uh, achieved my doctorate degree at uh, J John F. Kennedy University, Pleasant Hill and have been working in the field, uh, especially around addiction medicine for about 25 years. So um, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about uh, teaching and uh, uh, learning the disease model in particular. Um, I'm one of those kind of people that, uh, you know, if, if, if you're making a recommendation to me, I'll, I'll hear you and say, yeah, but I, I kind of want to know why, you know, the, the, the rationale for, say why we do a lot of the things and many of the recommendations in treatment. Um, I do believe that um, understanding the clinical rationale and foundation of the disease model um, helps equip clients with the, with the knowledge and power uh, to, to be able to effectively manage their disease um, and understand the reasons for why we recommend the things we do. So um, I also think I've, I've given this lecture uh, topic uh, to audiences of family members as well, because I think a lot of the material goes a long way towards dispelling a lot of myths and misunderstandings about the disease and challenging a lot of the social stigma that exists out there to this day. Um, let's see, I think it's important too uh, that, that we all strive to adopt a, a, a safe and non-judgmental view of exploring what's known as the main symptom of the disease, which is something called craving. Um, you know, uh, that, it, that it shouldn't be something that's shameful to uh, basically be able to comfortably talk about your symptoms. So uh, the value of sober support and through education and understanding, uh, trying to reach more people um, in terms of spreading the word about uh, uh, effective addiction treatment and that recovery is, is definitely possible uh, for people. So um, also I want to just refer to two, um, if, if there's families out there and, and, and clients and you're hungry for more knowledge around this, um, I've, I've used, there's two particular videos that I find helpful. One is called Pleasure Unwoven which is uh, done, it's a documentary by a recovering uh, medical doctor named Kevin McCauley. Uh, and another one would be uh, the HBO Addiction series. It's called HBO Addiction, Why Can't They Just Stop? And it's a four part DVD set. Um, but it, the reason I draw attention to these for Pleasure Unwoven, it delves into making the case for the disease model of addiction, as opposed to what's been known historically as the choice argument, which, which says that um, uh, people with the disease of addiction somehow uh, are, are uh, you know, a bad moral character or um, a willpower issue and all these kinds of things. So um, the HBO addiction series is very helpful, I think, because it shows some of the brain imaging studies that, uh, open the door for our understanding of the disease model. Um, it kind of changed my entire way of thinking when I saw, you know, uh, some of some of the uh, brain imaging studies. Uh, before that, we, we had uh, no way of knowing uh, what the cause of addiction was. Um, so now we have this not so newfound understanding, I think it's at least 30, 40 years or more, um, of understanding what's going on in the brain. And I think that's once again, a powerful tool for people to not use once they understand what's going on for them and how to effectively manage the disease. Um, you know, and one more thing before we get started is uh, one of my mentors who had gone through medical school and who, who taught me a lot of what I know about the disease model and also the uh, relapse prevention model that I was trained in. It's called SIM, or Craving Identification and Management. Um, 
it comes out of the uh, 2006 Journal of Psychoactive Drugs. So um, that's the relapse prevention model that I was trained in. But this, my mentor, he said, uh, as far as relieving or treating a lot of uh, medical illnesses, generally it's about just relieving suffering. And with the, the great thing with, with treating addiction is you're not just um, alleviating suffering, but you're restoring uh, joy and wellness for people. And um, that, that's what makes this so rewarding for me. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully by the time we're done, uh, you have a kind of an understanding of, of why, you, why there's a lot of aspects of the disease um, that, that's important to understand, such as um, why it's important to have a safe living environment to return to. Um, what is the value from a scientific standpoint of having a sober support system? Um, why is it the case that the disease tends to progress in the face of, of adverse uh, consequences? Um, why is it that daily structure is so important uh, in treatment? Uh, and also being careful of, as they say, your, your playgrounds and playmates, who, who you're around, in, especially in early recovery. So um, let's see. So when we think about the, the notion of, of addiction being a disease, um, and a chronic disease at that, uh, we know that it's progressive in nature, that, that it's chronic, meaning that uh, relapse or recurrence is a feature of the disease, uh, that it's potentially fatal if left untreated. Um, and so the goal with uh, not unlike other uh, you know, chronic um, medical conditions such as type two diabetes, hypertension, or asthma, the goal here is to, with a, with a working, what we call a recovery program, is to drive the disease into a state of sustained or full remission, where the person is no longer suffering symptoms of the disease and uh, that they, they can continue to live a happy, fruitful um, you know, life. Um, what we also see though with addiction is when people do experience relapse, it tends to pick up where it left off and, and further. So uh, the goal here is not perfection, but to extend periods of good functioning and as much as we can to shorten any periods of relapse. And the word I like to use is intensify, intensification of one's program in the event of a relapse to specifically address, you know, what, what got the best of them in that moment or contributed to the relapse strengthen around that and move forward stronger than before. Um, okay, so uh, just to start off, um, drugs and alcohol activate the pleasure producing chemistry of the brain. And uh, the main neurotransmitter involved is, is one called dopamine, uh, which is experienced as intensely pleasurable. Um, overstimulation of pleasure pathways causes them to neuroadapt, which I'll explain, interfering with the normal experience of pleasure. So neuroadaptation is the idea that you're, you're starting to create changes in your own brain chemistry as a result of taking an addictive substance over the course of time. Um, so addiction begins its work in a place of the brain called the limbic center, which is a set of nuclei that sits on top of the, the, uh, on top of the brain stem. And it's often referred to as the reptilian brain. Um, it's a part of the brain that is not necessarily a conscious part of the brain. It's maybe responsible for the next 15 seconds of our, our, um, our, our existence at a time. This part of the brain evolved for the purposes of pursuing rewards in the environment that are key to our survival, such as food and sex. So um, whenever we do these behaviors, uh, we get a small release of that reward neurotransmitter called dopamine. Um, but there's also other behaviors like food, um, sex, uh, learning, uh, goal-directed activity. Um, whenever we do those behaviors, if you think of that, um, that whole collection of behaviors, what, what that translates to for us as a species, 
is basically those are all survival behaviors. So what we're suggesting and saying here is that we get chemically rewarded for doing behaviors that promote our own survival, okay? Um, and once again, uh, this, this all starts in the limbic brain. Um, and these are also called drive states. Um, if you look at a person in the throes of active addiction, you know, is there much thought or attention giving to, giving to uh, being on a normal sleep schedule or eating regularly, um, caring for responsibilities, um, or even self-care? Uh, the answer is no. There's, there's basically that, that, that starts to fall off. Um, ask yourself, do you think this is, that would be purposeful or non-purposeful behavior? So the answer would be that it's, it's actually non-purposeful behavior. It's not intended. It's a byproduct of the fact that now the brain is re receiving huge dopamine surges and it literally, the drugs and alcohol go to the top of that survival hierarchy, even though it doesn't deserve that position. So what do I mean by that? In other words, uh, drugs and alcohol aren't going to keep you alive if you're starving, right? But it, but over time, it becomes just as important or linked with survival. So that's, I think, critical to understand. Um, also, this is a rationale for why daily structure is so important to get on a normal sleep schedule, start eating regularly, um, getting, getting support. It's a way of uh, hitting reboot and starting to restart those normal drive states again, which is what we want. So, um, so that's a rationale for why daily structure is so important. Um, so next, uh, neuro or addiction is a disease of the pleasure producing chemistry of the brain and neuroadaptation is the mechanism of the disease. So that's the path, neuroadaptation is the pathway by which the brain starts to become hijacked. Um, and like we said, at the expense of a lot of other important survival behaviors, okay, like caring for oneself. So think about this, how would you know if you're becoming neuroadapted to the stimulation of drugs and alcohol or, or alcohol or both? Um, so the answer to this is twofold. Um, you know, in treatment, we talk about both signs and symptoms. A symptom is what the person reports subjectively, like my life feels unmanageable or I, I feel depressed. You wouldn't be able to necessarily know this without asking someone. Another thing is, is what's called signs. And these are observable to a person. So there's two signs in particular that a person's becoming uh, neuroadapted to the stimulation of drugs and or alcohol. Um, the first one is something called tolerance. So tolerance is defined as needing more and more to achieve the desired effect. Um, a lot of people would guess maybe the, to achieve the same effect. And it's a semantic difference, but it's an important one. So if you're taking an addictive substance day after day at the same dosage, what happens after a while? Your body starts to acclimate to that dosage and you're no longer getting the desired effect or the high that you're looking for. So how do people typically solve that problem, right? They increase their dose. And this is how you start going up the steps of a ladder and a person achieves a high tolerance. Um, this is why someone could possibly have a, a, a you know, point of 4.0, like a blood alcohol level and still be conscious. But if that, if a person had that much alcohol without tolerance, they would probably stop breathing and die. So um, it's not that the person's in control in any way. It's just that they're able to um, somehow still be conscious at that high of a tolerance. So that's part one that you're becoming neuroadapted. I, I like to think of it as setting a thermostat higher and higher, um, higher, higher, higher and higher levels, um, which has implications that we'll talk about soon here. So that's part one is achieving tolerance. Part two would be basically what goes up must come down. And that would be withdrawal. So when upon cessation of the, of the substance, the person starts to experience um, significant physiological uh, withdrawal symptoms. And that's gonna be a mirror image 
of whatever the high produced and it's very drug specific. So with opiates, we, we'd see three things generally. Um, they'll, they lift your mood, provide some degree of motivation, and of course, relieve pain, which is why they're used in medical settings. You flip that upside down and what do you got? You know, in, intense pain, uh, flu-like symptoms, um, real struggles with motivation and, and basically depression. Um, with alcohol and benzodiazepines, you're likely, you're gonna see uh, significant uh, anxiety, uh, blood pressure through the roof, um, lowered uh, seizure threshold in danger of uh, withdrawal related seizure. So this is where having um, a medically supervised uh, detoxification process is really critical for people that they, they need this help to safely get off the addictive substance. Um, and that's what, that, that's what we can do here in treatment in residential care. It, um, you know, we're a ASAM 3.7 level care facility. We're, we're medically monitored. We can carefully uh, get a person's tolerance down in a, in a safe controlled manner. So they're not going to experience any kind of medical crisis. Um, so those are the, those are the two pieces of evidence that a person's becoming neuroadapted to the stimulation of drugs and or alcohol. Um, okay, next, um, once neuroadaptation occurs, cessation of a drug leads to, like I said, an inversion of the high, sobriety becomes pleasureless. Um, so once the body is unable to maintain a state of homeostasis, it resorts to something different called allostasis, which is a way of maintaining, maintaining stability through change. And so that's what I was talking about, that the thermostat keeps getting set higher and higher. Um, okay, so next we'll talk about um, more neuroadaptation in more detail. So I'm going to read a, a, a part of the um, article here. Um, so in direct response to overstimulation, brain regions decrease in sensitivity and responsiveness. Brain regions become unresponsive or deaf to usual or normal levels of stimulation, a process by which the reward and pleasure centers of the brain adapt to high concentrations of pleasure uh, neurotransmitters in the form of tolerance. So what all that means is basically, I like to call it the, the concert example. So if we've all had the experience of, of going to a loud music concert without earplugs, you get out of the show and someone's you know, talking to you at normal levels and you can't hear a thing they're saying because in this example, your auditory receptors have been bombarded at a really high level of stimulation in the form of decibels, you know, the measure of sound. So going back to addiction, because a person has been using large amounts of drugs and or alcohol to stimulate their dopamine receptors, the ability to feel normal pleasure in early recovery is, is, is going to be somewhat impaired for a while. Um, in other words, they're going to be pleasure death. And there's a name for this. It's called anhedonia. Um, I'll spell it. It's A-H-E-D-O-N-I-A, -A, um, anhedonia. So that's it. It's basically an inability to feel normal pleasure. Um, and it's a common symptom of something called post-acute withdrawal syndrome, that is a constellation of symptoms that people, it's, it's normal to experience this for people coming off alcohol and or drugs. And um, it could include things like irritability, uh, restlessness, low frustration tolerance, and um, anhedonia. Um, so it's like, here's normal. You've been hitting your dopamine receptors at this high level. And so now you've initiated abstinence and now in early recovery, you're going to be, your ability to feel normal pleasure is going to be down in the trough below the normal level. And so the way this, this manifests is kind of like this resistance where nothing, nothing sounds pleasurable or you're not able to feel normal pleasure. Um, and that's a pretty normal thing to go through. So we really want to educate people about this, that, that there are things you can do within your control to feel better more often. One of the very best things a person could do is turning to something, turning to uh, exercise. 
as a way of boosting dopamine in natural, healthy ways. Also, this is a disease of the pleasure and reward centers of the brain. So it makes a lot of sense to me to start to reintroduce pleasurable activities that you know, at least you used to enjoy, but have maybe dropped as a result of increased drug and alcohol use and start to reconnect with some of those pleasurable activities. Even though you're not gonna really feel much pleasure at first, uh, there's a great saying from AA that goes, fake it till you make it, which I like to borrow for this example, where we're saying, yeah, try, try doing some of these things like, pick up that guitar that you used to play or take a, take a walk for 20 minutes or, um, you know, anything that, that is, is obviously safe for your recovery that would be pleasurable and it will start to catch up over time. So the treatment for the anhedonia would be, you know, uh, do the thing that sounds remotely pleasurable, then see how you feel after you do it. Because what's happening is your brain in early recovery is assessing the perceived enjoyment of that activity and then unconsciously weighing it against the idea of drinking or using, even though you don't literally want to drink or use. But your answer is likely to be something like, oh, I don't know, it doesn't sound fun to me. So like I say, the, 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 the thing to do would be to try to push through that resistance and start to reintroduce some pleasurable activities and it'll start to catch up with time. But it takes a while for the brain to heal and re rebalance itself. Um, like three, six months, a year out is considered early recovery. Okay. So next, um, so under unstimulated conditions or without drugs, there is profound interference with the ability to experience normal pleasure. When sober, the user feels anhedonia, anxiety, anger, frustration, and craving, all symptoms of post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Okay, next, um, in addition to pleasure neurotransmitters, other brain pathways stimulated by drugs also become underactive, directly leading to anxiety, depression, loss of energy. So I think what this is saying is that it's not just dopamine in isolation that is adversely impacted by drugs and alcohol. Um, other neurotransmitter systems, which we're still just beginning to understand, uh, can, be, can be negatively impacted by drugs and alcohol. So examples would be like serotonin, norepinephrine, um, uh, acetylcholine, um, you know, the GABA system in particular, which is for, for calming and self-soothing. Uh, th those, those neurotransmitter systems, I kind of, for, for myself, I kind of think of them as like different levels on a stereo system, like an equalizer where you've got your base, your mid-range, your treble, your subwoofer. Um, and perhaps when someone comes in the door for treatment, a lot of those systems or neurotransmitter levels might be out of harmony. So part of our task is how to bring those back into harmony. Um, some of it may correct itself, um, like, like um, reducing dopamine surges by, by not using or drinking and, 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 uh, and whatnot. But other neurotransmitter systems um, may need some support from a pharma pharmacological standpoint. And this kind of opens the door to what's known as dual diagnosis treatment or co-occurring disorders, where people may, not everyone, but may, some people ha may have a co-occurring mental health. Uh, they meet, meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis. And at the same time, a co-occurring addiction diagnosis. So, um, <coughs> Um, let's see. So addiction is often understood as a disease of, of teenagers. It often starts in the teenage years. So from a behavioral psychology standpoint, what would be, maybe aside from peer pressure, what's the first level of reinforcement for addiction? Um, most of us would probably say the pleasure or euphoric effect that's produced. So we've all heard of the so-called gateway substances or um, things like nicotine, alcohol, marijuana. These are things people may experiment with in the beginning um, until through trial and error, they, they may land on what, what could end up being their drug of choice that they put two and two together and realize, you know, whenever I use this particular substance, not only do I get that euphoric effect, but I actually experienced temporary escape or relief 
from my unwanted symptoms of mental illness. So now we have a twofold reinforcement. You've got the positive reinforcement. By the way, positive reinforcement is defined as reinforcing behavior by adding a stimulus. In this case, you get the euphoric effect from it. <clears throat> um, but when people experience temporary escape or relief from their unwanted mental health symptoms, now you're adding a secondary level of reinforcement um, called negative reinforcement. So negative reinforcement is, is understood or defined as you're removing a stimulus that leads to reinforcement of behavior. So when I, when I first heard that uh, in school, I thought, well, wait, how does that work? Why would someone want to do something more if it's a takeaway? So I'll, I'll try to explain it here. Um, another day, exa everyday example of negative reinforcement would be when you get in the car, you turn the ignition and there's that annoying kind of buzzer sound, which, which prompts you to do what? To, to buckle your seatbelt. So, um, you know, the, the Department of Transportation or auto industry has installed those buzzers for a reason, and that is to behaviorally reinforce seatbelt compliance. So by doing the desired behavior and buckling your seatbelt, you get to temporarily turn off what we could characterize as a noxious stimuli, which reinforces seatbelt compliance, right? So let's go back to addiction. Um, people learn that whenever I use what might end up being my drug of choice, I get to temporarily turn off that annoying symptom or symptoms that I don't want to deal with, such as... Um, the, the, you know, the fear underneath the anxiety, um, crushing depression, uh, feelings of chronic boredom, uh, intrusive memories of past trauma, whatever it is I'm trying to seek escape or relief from, addictive substances can work to temporarily take that away and or, or relieve that temporarily. And that's a, that's a key word is temporarily. So the problem with that model, so to speak, is that it's unsustainable. What ends up happening is that the addictive substance um, actually uh, exacerbates, it masks and exacerbates that underlying problem. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you're using alcohol to treat your anxiety, how are you going to feel whenever you're not drinking or using it to treat depression? Um, in other words, what starts to happen is it, it, it starts to get exponential. You're adding some degree of substance induced anxiety and it's 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 actually going to uh, amplify or magnify uh, that underlying depression and it, it becomes unsustainable so hopefully a person has access to treatment um, and, and, and gets help at some point in time and is able to initiate abstinence um, but they've also got a, a history of what we could uh, what we call self-medicating so that's a phenomenon where people uh, learn to take matters into their own hands and self-medicate with the use of substances in an obviously misguided attempt to try to get some kind of relief from their inadequately or untreated mental health symptoms. So a person has now entered a treatment modality, hopefully, and they've initiated abstinence. And in the days and weeks to follow, it's critical that we, we as a treatment provider play, uh, pay close attention to what, what, what's, what's going on for them in terms of any um, uh, you know, appearance of mental health symptoms. So um, like I said, that the addictive substance may mask the underlying problem. Um, I've heard this termed uh, a symptom flare where now whatever has been masked by the drinking you're using is now gonna show itself in all likelihood. So. For some people, it may sound strange, but abstinence can actually exacerbate their underlying mental health symptoms. So if that's not given proper attention, that person may likely experience uh, significant cravings to use drugs or alcohol to try to get relief if we're not um, you know, paying attention to that. So I can't stress enough how, how this is a collaborative approach. It's why we assess um, you know, in treatment day to day, week to week, um, how is your mental health? How are your mental health symptoms? How's your anxiety? What's your depression score? Uh, what's your craving score? How's your sleep going? Um, we don't want people suffering in silence. Um, a key though 
is that let's say a person has been using alcohol to treat treat their anxiety and now they've stopped drinking uh you know can we give them uh xanax or clonopin uh once they're this is past the detox phase um the answer is we have to be very careful in the selection of medications uh, because we, we don't want to have something result in cross addiction, which is basically swapping one, one addictive substance for another. So the selection of medications by the, by the medical providers, um, you know, keeps in mind things that are um, known as psychotropic medications, which are non-addictive. They're not going to cause these, these dopamine surges. Uh, and that's another principle of the disease model is what's known as the dopamine hypothesis which is that we want to stay vigilant to anything that can contribute to dopamine surges in early recovery, whether that's loading up on caffeine or sweets, or even people can even manipulate their behaviors in some way um, to lead to dopamine surges, things like gambling, um, codependency is even a form of process addiction. Um, so to be really mindful and vigilant about whatever you're putting in your body that could lead to dopamine surges as well as behaviors. Um, so uh, as we're going along in early recovery and treatment, um, for some people, they start to, um, there, there are any mental health symptoms they may struggle with start to remit or reduce with time. Their anxiety goes down and whatnot. They start to feel better and better as time goes by. For other individuals, they might actually describe feeling worse because like I was saying, there's, there's a rebound maybe of that they never knew or were never previously diagnosed with a, you know, a, a clinical depression or, or anxiety disorder or whatnot or post-traumatic stress. Um, so we need to really address that in treatment ongoing. And um, there's also what's known as the feel good, feel bad hypothesis. And both are correct, but one says that um, that, you know, that there's a genetic link with addiction that people, um, some people are born with a lower than normal number of dopamine receptors. They're called low responders. So it takes more alcohol for them to become impaired, which ends up put, putting them at risk for addiction. Um, then there's the feel bad hypothesis, which is where people may describe that they, they just never felt quite right in, in, at, at, when they were younger until they tried their first drug of abuse and then you get a range of responses like i felt normal for the first time the fear just went away uh life was a lot more interesting uh so you, you that may be a window into um, um the mental health piece we also uh, want to take a careful history and uh whether it's through the biopsychosocial uh, assessment through the h and p the history and physical you know when, when clients come in the door to assess, um, is there a previous history of, of addiction as well as mental health issues, as well as trauma, you know, that, that, uh, that preceded the development of the addiction or has uh, contributed and maintained it? Is there history as well in the family of history of addiction and or mental health issues? Because there could be a genetic components with, with each of those. So, um, and then like we were saying, is the person, you know, endorsing uh, worsening mental health symptoms as time is going by? So we really want to be on top of treating that. Um, when someone's hung over out of their mind, they might they may not know how depressed they really are, and people are, may not know that um, they can actually get well, you know, um, and um, you know start to re reclaim their lives, uh, knowing they don't they don't have to live this way anymore. So. Um, Okay, so next, um, once, neuro once neuro adapted, the pleasure system can remain impaired for months to years, interfering with sobriety, learning, and impulse inhibition. I think that's a bit overstated because what we, we tend to see as far as years is if you keep a healthy perspective of, about recovery, let's say you've been using or drinking for 18 years or 28 years or 38 years, it's not going to take that long to start to feel some uh, significant healing within the first year. So, um, but there's a lot of adages from AA, like, like easy does it one day at a time. Uh, you know, everybody wants the bandaid to come off and to be healed and wants a quick fix, but it, it does take some time. 
And we wanna educate people around this too, uh, going back to post-acute withdrawal syndrome is that can, it's not necessarily because it's such a severe symptom, it's because it lasts a long time. Like even a year out, people can describe uh, easily feeling frustrated, uh, you know, with, with, with little things uh, bothering them and whatnot. And so having compassion for oneself, you know, and others in recovery is really important. People in early recovery are stress sensitive. So it's important to, to learn ways of practicing um, healthy, effective ways of managing stress as well. Um, there's four major causes of where craving can arise from. Um, the first big one would be environment. That's people, places, things, and events. Uh, the next would be inadequately or unmanaged withdrawal symptoms, which is why a medically monitored detoxification process is so important. And even using what we could call like relapse prevention medications, things like uh, naltrexone and, and other things that are more tools in the toolbox to, to really help in early recovery. <clears throat> the third major cause of craving we just talked about is inadequately or untreated mental health symptoms. And then the last one would be stress. So becoming skilled at managing stress. Um, there's something we also teach called a uh, HALT, which is hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Each of those essentially can contribute to stress if not properly managed day to day. Um, so let's see, um, but we'll, we'll go ahead and continue. Uh, so um, kind of want to talk a little more about the brain itself. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's what's where addiction begins its work is in the limbic brain. Um, what's happening is that through those dopamine surges, the metabolic activity in the limbic center, which is that kind of a primitive part of the brain, and it's responsible, excuse me, for, for things like drug craving, cueing, environmental cueing, hunger, greed, lust, fear, rage, jealousy. These are all uh, you know primal urges. And its whole MO is I want it and I want it now. Um, and once again, that part of the brain evolved for the pur purposes of pursuing rewards in the environment that are key to our survival. Uh, this is normally, this part of the brain is normally counterbalanced by this part of the brain, which is known as the prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's not finished developing until we're around between 23, 25 years old. Um, it's, it's also uh, uh, known as the executive functions. So it's responsible for things like decision-making, logic, judgment, ethics, uh, salience, weighing value, or an important task called consequential thinking. And that's that ability to say, if I do this, this may happen. If I run this yellow light, I could get in a major accident. So I'm going to put the brakes on. Um, that's also another way of, you know, uh, understanding these different parts of the brain and how they normally work together in balance. But um, the limbic brain, you could, you could simplify it and think of it as the green light, the go system, or the gas pedal. And in contrast, that prefrontal cortex is the red light system, the brakes, or the stop system. And both are important. But what, what starts to happen as a person becomes neuroadapted to the stimulation of drugs and or alcohol is that metabolic activity in that limbic brain starts to really increase, gets overactivated, uh, which has consequences. So as I mentioned, that uh, HBO series is very helpful as a, a companion for this material that we're going through right now. So in the study, um, there's a, a gentleman in early recovery from, from, in this case, cocaine addiction. And he, he volunteers for the study. He uh, receives what's called a glucose marker, which is uptaken into his bloodstream. And he, is, he goes into an fMRI machine, a functional MRI. And inside the machine, it, it's, they've mounted a little a video a camera, not a camera, but a screen that shows half second cocaine cues, split second. So it's actually outside of his conscious awareness. He doesn't know what he's seeing on the screen, but keep in mind, he's in early recovery. Um, it's showing on the brain imaging, and this is a real time scan. It shows what areas of the brain 
are active or lighting up with activity. And um, so the areas with the hot colors, yellow, orange, and red are basically exploding with activity, which happens to be in the limbic brain. Um, when I first saw that, I realized that is not something, that's not a response that you can suppress in the brain. In other words, you can't not have that happen. You can do something once you're aware you've been triggered though. People generally are aware when they're triggered. So that involves taking action, like turning to what we call an avoidance strategy <clears throat> to remove yourself from what's triggering you or a recovery tool, which is some kind of behavior that can work effectively to dissipate craving quickly, such as exercise, calling your sponsor, prayer or meditation, turning to a pleasurable hobby or interests, um, anything like that that can uh, kind of change the channel and get you out of that craving state. Um, so in contrast on the brain imaging study, um, his prefrontal cortex is virtually inactive. It's, it's uh, the, the cooler colors like blue and purple. So what that means is that that prefrontal cortex is not getting involved in the, in the conversation there. Um, it explains why a person, um, if you think about the role of the prefrontal cortex, it evolved to keep us safe in the pursuit of those, of those rewards coming out of the limbic system. So the way this all fits together is, let's say I'm walking along, you know, looking for a food source to bring back to the village, okay? And I come across a river and across the river, I see a food source. My limbic brain is gonna say, go get the reward. Um, hopefully if my prefrontal cortex is working, it's gonna kick in and assess the situation for danger. And I'm gonna notice that, okay, that water, just like we're having in the Sierras right now, that water coming down the river is probably, you know, 32 degree mountain snow melt runoff. There's some large boulders. And then further down, I see there's a waterfall. So if I just throw caution to the wind and jump in and try to swim across and I get this wrong, I'm going to get swept over the waterfall and that's the end of me. So instead, I'm going to make the decision to pass on that reward and go look elsewhere. So that keeps me safe. Um, and that's how this all fits together. So what would happen though, if you didn't have a, a good working prefrontal cortex, you can start to appreciate the implications of um, a lot of impulsive risk-taking behavior without thought of the consequences. So this explains to a large degree how it is that addiction tends to progress in the face of adverse consequences why people can uh, rack up multiple DUI charges, having uh, you know, catastrophic health consequences, relationships like cognitive mental health issues um, made, made worse by drinking, using, um, loss of trust, all these things that accompany addiction. Why is it that it tends to progress despite those consequences? This provides the scientific reason for that. Um, is that that prefrontal cortex is not getting involved in the decision-making. So the good news here is that addiction results in what's known as acquired hypofrontality. Um, so hypofrontal is underactive, hypo, anything hypo. Uh, prefrontal cortex is that this part of the brain, which like I said, doesn't finish developing until we're about 25 years old. So addiction, because it creates these brain changes, um, results in this imbalance in those parts of the brain. So it, it's, it's like not having a filter. That's another function of that prefrontal cortex is, you know, what something known as disinhibition. So we, say you take someone who's normally shy and introverted and they're, they're at a, a cocktail party and they've had a couple of drinks. What do you notice about their behavior? They may start to become loose or maybe even inappropriate say things they, they shouldn't say or are or, or maybe results in embarrassing, um, they become disinhibited. That's, a, that's, that's what happens in the prefrontal cortex. So even though, this is really important to understand, even though a person has initiated abstinence, for a while afterwards, um, they're still neuroadapted, meaning uh, we really want to err on the side of caution as far as being cautious about faulty decision-making in early recovery. 
Uh, this also underscores the value of being regularly connected to the sober support system. Sober support is a safeguard against what, what's often re referred to as stinking thinking in early recovery, because it's a it, it um, it's sort of a checks and balances against that uh, you know um, decision making that could put a person in danger. Um, okay, so there's also um, it is it is developmentally normal uh, for teenagers to be hypofrontal. Um, that um, they tend to take risks a lot. Um, and we just, we just talked about the fact that addiction results in acquired hypofrontality. So now you can probably start to appreciate why, you know, adding drugs and alcohol to a developing teenage brain could result in some really bad decision-making because you've got that developing brain in addition to um, acquired hypofrontality from drugs and alcohol. Uh, there, there's also other forms of hypofrontality. Um, you know, when someone's in a manic phase with, who struggles with bipolar disorder, um, they, they're kind of hypofrontal in terms of making uh, impulsive risk-taking decisions. So uh, combining alcohol drugs with that can, can lead to some very bad uh, decisions. Um, unfortunately, there's also some permanent forms of hypofrontality, such as concussions, uh, to, to, to be mindful aware of. Um, but, but the good news of, with addiction is that every day that goes by where a person is not drinking or using, the brain starts to balance itself out and you have that prefrontal cortex starting to wake up again. It's, and, um, there's, there's actually a psychological tool or mental strategy that we use or teach for breaking craving. And it's something called playing the tape. So the way it works is that a person's maybe been triggered by something. <clears throat> Playing the tape is a way of mentally walking through all the way to the consequences based on what happened last time they, they drank or used. So it's I think of it as almost like doing push-ups for this part of the brain, which isn't getting much activity in the beginning because it's it's been neuroadapted. Um, so... It's uh, some people call it think through the drink, or um, it's basically exercising consequential thinking. Even better if you you know do that on the phone with your sponsor, thinking through to the consequences. And so that would be considered a psychological tool or mental strategy for breaking craving. Um, okay, let's see. Um, also, as far as that limbic brain, um, it's, it's important to use what's called avoidance strategy. So let's imagine you're in your home, you open the refrigerator door and there's, there's alcohol there. You know, that's gonna trigger your limbic brain um, whether you want it to or not. So I'm of the opinion that it's actually absolutely critical to have a safe living environment that is conducive to one's recovery so that you're not, um, constantly bombarded with triggers in your own home. Um, it can be challenging enough navigating the outside world, uh, the environment with all the triggers that are out there, going to the grocery store, um, you know, advertisements, all these different things that could lead to being triggered. Um, so at the least, we wanna have the home environment be a sanctuary. It's a big reason why people may voluntarily choose to enter into sober living because it's a temporary means to an end. It's a way of, of getting a good start in early recovery um, with others who are in a similar boat um, and, and learning how to adopt a recovery uh, lifestyle. So, okay, we'll, we'll continue more here. Um, okay, so baseline metabolism uh, falls in that prefrontal cortex, like we were talking about. Um, secondary to decreased excitatory dopamine input. Uh, impaired decision-making results from direct interference with reasoning, logic, and the ability to weigh consequences. Drives, impulses, and craving are not inhibited because of direct compromise of brain reasoning ability. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the brake linings are, are worn out on the, on the, uh, on the brakes, but the gas pedal is working. So that's, you know, that's a dangerous combination. I think we would agree. Um, but over time, that ability to play the tape or put the brakes on becomes uh, improved. 
Uh, so the mind overvalues the perceived reward in using and fails to appreciate risk and fails to activate systems that warn of impending danger. The mind misjudges using as being worth it by being unable to appreciate the adverse consequences. So this is essentially our scientific definition of what's commonly referred to as denial. So, the, so denial is where the person literally can't see the danger they're putting themselves in. Um, it's a remarkable symptom that tends to get worse with time. This is a disease that convinces you you don't have it. Um, so that becomes more and more pronounced um, as the disease progresses. Um, it's not uncommon for others around the person to become more concerned than the person is about their own welfare. Um, so this is why having a sober support system can be so important as a safeguard against um, you know, questionable decision-making to kind of have that non-judgmental, compassionate support around you to be able to bounce ideas off of in early recovery, especially the first year, so that you're not unintentionally putting yourself in harm's way. An example of that would be like going to the bar with old drinking buddies and saying, I'm not going to drink. Um, they know I'm not supposed to relapse or, or I got this, you know, feeling overconfident. And um, meanwhile, you're, you're getting, the person's getting all the visuals They're they're they, you know, but they can't have any. So that, that is what we would call a test of personal control, which is, as you can understand, extremely ill-advised. We don't want put pe people putting themselves in high risk situations. Um, but the reality is people often, you know, it's a, it's a very good sounding alibi, but that's how cra craving is such a pernicious process that it aims to get its needs met by putting the person in proximity with using or drinking, um, uh, even though it sounds like a good argument. So uh, um, like once, I, once again, I said that like it's valuable to have the sober support system as a safeguard or protective factor against that stinking thinking creeping in. And I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with this, with this actual example of there was a guy in early recovery who, he got this idea in his head that as a way to prove to himself that he could shut the door on his disease once and for all, he decided to go to the door of his old dealer, knock on the door and say, I just want to let you know, I won't be needing your services anymore. So when I tell that story, people often, you know, kind of laugh as if to say, well, wow, what was he thinking? Which is the whole point of the story is that because he was craving he really had himself convinced that this was a good idea. He couldn't appreciate or see the danger that he was putting himself in. But um, so he wasn't, he wasn't lying. He was just, you know, in, in, in our uh, definition of denial that he couldn't see the danger he was putting himself in. So um, once again, we need to make it really safe for people to be able to have others to be able to talk about their cravings with, um, to become skilled at managing craving. Um, and to uh, receive the support um, that people need in their recovery. So having a balance of maybe like clinical, um, clinical, medical, as well as a sober support system through perhaps AA or NA, um, smart recovery life ring, people get well in different ways. So no two people's program is going to look the same. Each person is going to have a unique pathway to wellness that we need to understand as providers and support that in every way we can. So we work from day one to develop um, a, a robust aftercare plan, um, to, to have a, a safe plan for if someone gets into trouble, that they don't hesitate to call right away and immediately rush back to treatment. And like I say, intensification of their existing program, because maybe 80 or 90% of what they've been doing is working but clearly maybe something got the best of them that led to the relapse. So our approach is not to say that's over, that's the end. You know, um, it, you haven't unlearned everything you've learned about recovery, but our task at hand is to narrow down and determine what contributed to the relapse and move forward, <laughs> treat it like a learning experience, which is exactly what it is, to take the shame and guilt out of the relapse and um, strengthen around what got you and move forward from it stronger than before. So that's that's how I would determine long-term success. 
is like we say with any chronic condition, we want to shorten any duration of relapsing and lengthen the good times, the good, the good functioning to the point where we drive the disease into a state of full remission or sustained remission. And um, the person has a, a successful working recovery program. Um, okay. Um, just want to thank everybody for, for being part of this uh, lecture series. And um, I hope it was helpful. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a pleasure for me to do this. And uh, I, I hope it was helpful for everyone. And um, uh, best, best of luck to everybody. And please, you know, we have a, a growing amount of alumni uh, that um, is, there, is there for ongoing support. So we're, we're in this for the long haul. This is not just sort of a one and done where, uh, you know, you finish 30 days or 45 days or and then that's it, goodbye. We're, we want to support people ongoing and um, we are invested in success.